standing and just being polite, uh, please feel free to grab one of the available seats. This is a great crowd. Thanks for coming out on this absolutely beautiful spring day in Toronto. We're, we're, close your eyes and imagine it is coming. Well, I guess it's going to be in June during Luminato, spring in, spring in Toronto. Um, please grab your coffee or any other refreshments um, you want. It's, it's just so wonderful to be surrounded here by so many friends and so many partners of Luminato, uh, both in the upcoming year and over the years. I'm Janice Price. I'm the uh, CEO of Luminato, um, which makes me today and many other days Yorn's opening act which is a great role to play. Um, some of us were, were having a little breakfast um, before today's event, and I was chatting with our great Torontonian and, and one of a few um, godparents of the Luminato Festival idea, that great Torontonian and restaurateur Roberto Martella. Um, he actually shared with me a little known fact. Um, Luminato can also apparently be interpreted in Italian as an early morning media event. Who knew? We always wondered, what does the word Luminato mean? Um, I, I want to open by thanking the staff and uh, the management of the Sony Center um, for hosting us once again at this absolutely beautiful venue. Thank you, our Sony Center friends. We'll be back here again this year, but some of you know it was actually on this stage that Einstein on the Beach premiered at Luminato last year. Um, so this morning, uh, I hope you did drink coffee because we have a special treat. We're gonna do a one-off private performance of the whole four and a half hours of Einstein on the Beach. Anybody who missed it? No, 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 we're not gonna do that. Um, for the past uh, seven years, it's been my privilege to share with Toronto um, each year the incredible lineup of events and programs that we bring together for 10 days each June at uh, Luminato. And I'm really proud to leave the, lead the wonderful team at the festival, and I want to thank now the um, dedicated but small uh, year-round staff that actually get this train going all year long, the seasonal staff that then jump on board and get very quickly up to speed to make the festival happen, um, and also our incredible uh, volunteer uh, board of directors um, who really help us and, and guide the ship throughout the year. So thank you to all of you. I know you're really eager to hear about this year's program, um, but I have to do a few more acknowledgements, of course, as you know. First, um, our wonderful partner in creativity, um, L'Oreal Canada. Um, we've, been, we've been prone to saying um, they've been with us since the very beginning, but I know because I was part with our board chair, Tony Galliano, of, of those very first early meetings, and I can say that actually L'Oreal was worth Lumina with Luminato before the beginning. They made their incredible commitment before there was even one festival um, that they could witness and, and, and see our vision come to life. So an incredible leap of faith. We couldn't imagine a better partner to embark once again on this journey together this year. Um, our founding government partner, of course, is the province of Ontario. They've been true leaders in understanding more globally the, the really vital role that the entire arts and culture community plays um, as an industry, as a sector, and of course in the uh, quality of life of all on Ontarians. And I do see and welcome some of our, our friends from the Ministry of Tourism, Sport and Culture here today. Um, we also received support from the Government of Canada, for which we are very grateful. They've been integral in helping us bring artists together from across the country. And then here at home, the City of Toronto um, also support us. That wasn't me. No. Um, the City of Toronto, and uh, welcome to some of our uh, councillors who've joined us from the city today. So as any arts administrator uh, can tell you, ticket sales only account for a small fraction of what it takes to put on the festival each year and to help us make the magic each year. We also rely on a very special group of, of city builders and art supporters. They're sometimes the unsung heroes of our sector. So I now want to acknowledge the tremendous generosity of Luminato's uh, founding luminaries, our supernova donors, and our patron circle members, and many uh, of those important folks are here with us today. So uh, if I have identified you, can you raise your hands so everyone knows the folks who have, they're, they're being very shy. They are here, trust me. 
Um, and also, finally, the dozens of uh, foundations, institutions, media partners, community partners who contribute greatly to the success of our programs. And finally, a big thank you to all of our corporate partners. Um, I see many of the representatives here today, and you will hear more from Jorn about the specific programs that they are supporting as we go through the festival. And those events, again, would not be possible without their generous partnership. So a big thank you to all of those funders, donors. Um, we really could not do it without them. Um, so it is now my pleasure to introduce uh, Stéphane Baroubé. He is the General Manager of Media Investment and Innovation with L'Oreal Canada. Thank you for joining us today and I'd like to invite you to say a few words. Thank you, Janice. Um, it's a privilege for me to be here today to, uh, to, in our partnership with uh, Luminato. Good morning to all. L'Oreal Canada is proud to partner once again this year with Luminato, and uh, we've been doing it since the beginning, uh, now seven years. Um, when Luminato approached us in 2007, we didn't want a traditional sponsorship. What we were looking for was a real partnership. And uh, I believe this is what we've been able to do together, uh, bringing some, uh, lots of content uh, to the festival and uh, partnering in uh, beauty and creativity. Since the beginning, we were confident that we can have a true part a collaborative partnership because one of the values of Luminato and L'Oreal that we have in common is creativity and beauty. The festival celebrates the arts in various forms, but most importantly, through beauty and creativity. Two concepts that are the art of what we're doing. For more than a century, L'Oreal have been doing one thing and one thing well, which is beauty. We're convinced that no single unique model of, um, of, uh, of beauty exists, but an infinite type of beauty, which is the same with creativity. And for L'Oreal Canada brand, Luminato has become over the years a great platform for our brands to express their creativity. Whether it's in mass interaction, like L'Oreal Paris, Matrix, L'Oreal Professional, and Vichy at the David uh, Picot Square, or on pre prestigious occasion, like the uh, YSL opening night party, the Redkin after hours for Luminato artists, or uh, the Biotherm um, uh, um, closing party, or simply being in involved in some creativity project like we're doing with, uh, with Lancôme, or simply intimate interaction with community in our Kiehl's stores. These activations will help create a unique and unforgettable experience for festival goers. I hope that you will join us in celebrating this year's festival, this, year, this year's creativity, and you will see, I had the privilege to see some of the program yesterday, I was uh, very impressed. I'm sure you will also be very impressed. Uh, it is, um, is it unbelievable uh, what uh, the festival did in the last seven years. And when you have a chance to look at what uh, we're gonna do this year, I'm sure uh, we're in good hands to have a super year once again this year. Thank you very much. Thank you to, uh, to all. Thank you, uh, thank you, Stéphane, merci, and yes, um, thank you for all the enhancements you brought and uh, to, to our audiences as they enjoy the festival season. So now, um, the piece de resistance. Um, it, it does feel like it wasn't that long ago that we were welcoming our new artistic director as he joined the Luminato family. Um, I can tell you that his, his vision and his humor and his perseverance often um, continue to uh, define how we see the artistic future of Luminato. Um, it's just been a joy to work with him. This is the first full festival um, under Jorn's uh, 100% curation. Um, I, I know you will uh, agree that you do see his, his presence and his personality throughout the program. He also has become a true um, Torontonian. It's been a, a big mutual embrace, and that gives me an opportunity also before I, I turn over the podium, although I know he will do that, to welcome also so many artists in the room today, including Jorn's husband, Rufus Wainwright, many artists from past and now this year's festival who are joining us today. Um, I really want to welcome you, uh, especially because, of course, we cannot do what we do um, without all of you. And so so now I'd like to invite Jorn to the stage to tell us all about Luminato 2013. 
Thank you, Janice. Thank you, Stefan. Good morning and welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for coming to the beautiful Sony Center. And uh, no, we're not doing Einstein on the beach, but the press conference is about four and a half hours long, no intermission. Uh, but there is a story, actually, which Einstein did not have. Similar to last year, um, <laughs> similar to last year, I will, I will be taking you through the entire program for 2013, but before doing that, I would like to do a little striptease. Um, not physically, fortunately, uh, but figuratively, and I, because I want to present you Luminato's new wardrobe. Um, after six years, and to kick off my first full season as the artistic director, we have been working tirelessly over the last few months on our new visual identity that will be reflected on everything that you see, including our season brochure, which has not arrived from the printer yet, but um, it will, hopefully, during the course of this uh, press conference. Um, after an open call for submissions, we interviewed a wide array of national and international design and branding companies and dis decided to work with um, the celebrated London and New York based firm Pentagram. Pentagram has worked on the new MoMA branding, the Metropolitan Opera, and 20 years ago they created the brand identity for the Brooklyn Academy of Music, which BAM continues to use um, to this day. And here is our new look. notice is that we finally decided to actually say what we are, a festival. <laughs> not an Italian pasta sauce, not a mystery light show, not a secret government agency, a new cleaning product, or a new Cirque du Soleil extravaganza, but actually a festival. So our name now is Luminato Festival, and since you're also allowed to still call Kleenex tissues just Kleenex, you can still say Luminato when you're talking about your hopefully most beloved festival in this city. I'm actually very happy and excited about this new look. I think it's playful, fun, colorful, even a little um, childlike. To me, the design reflects what we're doing, bringing different artists, different art forms together from all over and creating a colorful mosaic, an image for this city that is made up of so many individual parts and saying something that the individual parts would not be able to express by themselves. To me, that is what a festival is really about, not the sum of its parts, but something greater than the sum, a way to engage with the city in a different way, a way to experience the city in a different way, and a way to change the city. To me, a festival is a total work of art, or Gesamtkunstwerk, as Richard Wagner coined this term. Um, he was born 200 years ago um, this year, as was another great um, composer, Giuseppe Verdi, and you'll hear a little bit more about that later. He would use the word Gesamtkunstwerk to describe his music dramas, which were a new way of fusing text, music, and stage action where all theatrical elements would mutually enhance each other and drive the drama forward. The idea of fusion of different art forms is one that underlies a lot of the projects that, that we are presenting this year. But the idea of fusion is going even a little bit further than among just the different art forms. Quite a few ideas and projects are taking the leap into the audience and make the audience a participatory element that is essential to the completion of the work. More about that later. The beauty about a festival is <coughs> that, what we do, that what we do is that we do not have an institution. We have a blank slate. We have a city to work with and can weave our dreams right into the daily urban life. Festivals can be the place for cultural innovation. They can be the place where artists meet and think up new collaborations and ideas, where new forms are created, new genres might be born. Great art need not be understood. It needs to be experienced. You, you experience more with your heart than your head. I always wanted to tell the audience not to try to understand the work of art immediately. Instead, just let it happen. Don't ask why something is happening, but just how. Art is something that makes us see the world with new eyes. It should put us back into the state of the child, a state of wonder. A child sees everything for the first time. That is how we should approach art, even if it is an opera that is 150 years old. But nonetheless, I feel that we're obliged to pave the way for the audience to understand a work of art. My first sentence is always, don't try to understand it, and then I start pointing things out, look at this, watch out for that. For this reason, we're going to have a pre-performance um, introductory talk for every performance that we do. One of the most beautiful and valuable experiences actually for me last year with the festival was the direct contact with the audience 
during the pre-performance talks that I did for Einstein on the Beach downstairs. I could tell that people were nervous about seeing an opera that lasted four and a half hours and had no plot and no intermission. And at the end of my little speech, I could see they were actually brimming with anticipation to experience it. We have somewhat of an Einstein on the Beach antidote planned this year, Adam Agoian's production of Guo Wenjing's Fang Yiting, which is only 50 minutes long, <laughs> but it's an equally overwhelming and beautiful experience. It's not just an appetizer, but it's a full meal. I mentioned it here um, as Adam is sitting right next to us here, and he, has to sneak out of Salom he had to sneak out of Salome rehearsals to come here and talk about it for a few minutes. Um, what is wonderful about my job is that I am right now brimming with anticipation, anticipation to let the forces loose and hand what we've been working on over the last year over to the audience. To me, this is really the moment I work towards when the audience starts entering the picture. It is a bit like a wonderful striptease, and today the first pieces of clothing definitely falls. So let's start <coughs> with the first pieces. Our festival hub is going to be at David Pico Square again. The hub to me is really the heart of the festival. It is where everything comes together. It's the essence of who we are as a festival. It is the idea of transforming the city, of people coming together from all directions, cultures and ages to share experiences and emotions. And since we are a multidiscipline or all arts festival, as I like to call it, we're not only doing music at the hub this year, but we'll present many other art forms there. And similar to last year's Windscape by Diamond and Schmidt, we're working on a major artistic transformation on the hub, but it is not time yet for me to talk about much of this project, as we're still working in, on it, and I want to leave the final reveal until the start of the festival. So to say, in the striptease meta met metaphor, we're leaving the undies on for now, um, but it is an, uh, an installation that I can promise will absolutely dazzle you. Um, Serena Ryder and Chaos, two amazing artists born in Toronto, will open the festival at David Pico Square on Friday, June 14th. We will extend the square's 11 p.m. Cur sound curfew um, this year for the premiere of the outdoor version of Kid Koala's Space Cadet, as it is actually an experience that you hear through headphones. So it's a complete silent uh, performance. We have added a new ingredient to this widely presented and wildly successful space comic book DJ music odyssey by Montreal's whiz kid turntablist Kid Koala. In keeping with the idea of the Gesamtkunstwerk, Kid Koala has worked with the New York-based company IFF, International Flavors and Fragrances, who are actually the driving force behind many of the world's most uh, famous uh, fragrances and a, a very frequent uh, partner um, for L'Oreal. And I've done many projects with them before in the past. And these fragrances correspond with different plot points in the piece and will be handed out to the audience to experience uh, um, as the piece goes along. This is actually also our first ticketed show at the Hub. A second performance will be presented on Saturday evening after Long Shandao and Maxi Priest have taken reggae around the world from China. Long Shandao is a Chinese reggae band and I'm, I'm happy to see some of our friends from the Chinese um, consulate here to its home in Jamaica. Space Cadet will be presented by Kia Canada and with audio support from Sennheiser Canada. Sarah Harmer, Bombino, Amad Laurie Anderson and Daka Braca complete the opening weekend program at the Festival Hub, which pretty much covers the entire globe musically. The other more performative events we're offering at the Hub are Danse la Sa Danse on Wednesday night, a tribute to one of the greatest Canadian songwriters and singers from Quebec, who passed away far too early of breast cancer at the age of 33. This show premiered in Quebec and has successfully toured across the province in recent months. The Luminato presentation will be the first time it has been presented outside of Quebec. And I think Patricia Cano, who's opening um, for that piece, is um, with us tonight. It combines contemporary dance and uh, live music. Thursday night after pa Patrick Watson takes the stage with his band and a large string section, the German-English performance group Gob Squad presents Super Night Shot. Um, Sao, who are performing today later, um, open for Patrick Watson and um, that night. I saw the premiere of Super Night Shot in Berlin um, over 10 years ago, but don't worry, it's not an old piece. 
Last year, it was the biggest hit at Under the Radar in New York, and now Gobsport is bringing it to Toronto for the first time. It is an incredibly entertaining fusion of film, theater, and urban performance art. If you do not want to go to the uh, theater to see a piece, then Gob Squad armed with video cameras roaming through the city and then mixing the images that they captured live in front of the audience is the right thing for you. We will present them again on Saturday night after Roseanne Cash brings her unique country voice to the main stage. If we presented them, actually, I think, in a theater, we probably would have had a couple of hundred um, uh, people in the audience. Um, but on the square, um, only a few thousand will actually have to stay a little bit longer than the concert that they experience, and they will experience this new kind of piece of performance art. So we're trying to seduce also audience into, very naturally, um, as seduction usually is, into um, seeing other art forms. Gob Squad is supported by the Goethe Institute Canada and the Federal Republic of Germany. I'm really proud that my fellow countrymen um, stepped up to the plate here. There's so much more on the hub, but one act I want to single out, um, which is the Latin Grammy nominee um, Eki Alfonso in his Toronto debut as a solo artist playing June 18th. He's an outstanding musician fusing hip-hop, Afro, rock, Cuban sounds and adding film to his performance. This is truly something special and fits our mission to introduce also great artists to a general audience who have yet to be discovered in Canada. Our music programmer, Derek Andrews, can talk about all of that so much more eloquently than I can. And he's here today, so you can talk to him afterwards if you, if, you, if you wish. What we try to achieve with the music program is to reflect the diversity of the city and the diversity of music around the world, with artists who are interested in fusing styles, local and national traditions with other media art forms, and to broaden the offering on the main stage and bring other aspects of the programming from the dance or performance world onto that stage, to seduce the audience to experience other art forms. You can just stay in one place and the world and disciplines come to you. The Illuminato Festival stage is presented by OLG and Kia Canada with additional support from L'Oreal Professional, Biolage and Vichy. And since Adam is here, and since I know that he has to get back to rehearsals to um, deliver the head of Johanna and to Salome, I would like to invite him up um, now to talk about his project in this year's festival, Fang Yi Ting, based on an ancient Chinese tale fusing contemporary music with classical Chinese music sung in Mandarin, I think Illuminato premiere, uh, with English subtitles by two of the greatest stars of Chinese opera. And with stars, I actually mean René Fleming-like stars in those countries. I've admired Adam's work for such a long time, and to have him in my sort of first festival and to actually have uh, gotten to know him and his wonderful wife, Arsene, a little bit since coming to Toronto is truly one of those things I'm extremely grateful for. And here's Adam. Thanks, Jorn. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, Jorn mentioned in that uh, brilliant intro about uh, seduction happening naturally. Uh, and sometimes it happens in an unexpected way. In this case, I was uh, really busy preparing for a film shoot, but a project came on my desk, which was uh, this extraordinary text and uh, by uh, Gawain Sheng, this amazing composer, but it said specifically that it was a piece for uh, a singer from a Beijing opera tradition and a Chezuan opera tra tradition. And I thought, that's, that's amazing. I don't know anything really about the specifics of these traditions. And I plunged into this world. Uh, and it was just intoxicating. It was just an amazing journey. Um, and we had the privilege of presenting this uh, last summer. Uh, and it, it's an amazing piece because it's using very traditional uh, Chinese opera lines. The actual vocal lines are uh, pretty much classical, but the music by Gao Zheng is completely new, and it's, uh, it's so seductive. It's so, so wonderfully set and inspiring uh, to present it visually, and I had the privilege of being able to do that with an amazing team last summer. And I've uh, done a number of these projects uh, outside of Toronto over the past few years, and this is the first time that one is coming back. And Jorn, I really want to thank you for being able to do that, because often when you present these things out, out elsewhere, you think, oh, I'd just love to bring it back to the city, but sometimes it's not possible. They're just cumbersome, or it's just not practical. 
uh, and really t for Illuminato to have taken this risk and brought it back, and I know it'll get support from the uh, amazing Chinese community here because it's a rare event to have these major stars here in Toronto. Shantime is amazing. It's a whole different tradition from what we're working on now. I will say it's unusual to be working on two operas where you have manipulative women causing the death of very powerful men uh, presented in, a, in the matter of months. I'm not trying to create an agenda or said that uh, I'm not trying to rebrand myself uh, in any particular way, but that is what the two operas are essentially about. Um, I think that uh, this is really an extraordinary experience. I think this is exactly the right way to present it in the context of this amazing cultural event because it is about a fusion of different points of view. It'll create a lot of discussion and I'm just really excited to be there and I'm excited to be presenting Salome on Sunday and I have to rush off to that rehearsal. So thank you all very much. Thank you, it's very wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Adam, so much. And what he obviously did not mention is that his production is also absolutely spellbinding. And um, it's really rare, I think, that a film director or someone whose primary medium is film is also so good at directing um, stage work, and especially opera, which um, is a completely different kind of theatrical medium. Um, so I highly encourage you to come and see this. Um, it's definitely one of the highlights of the festival. Fang Yiting was produced by Spoleto Charleston and the Lincoln Center Festival, where I actually saw it. And what Adam also did not mention is that he himself is going to do the pre-performance talks for every, of the three, every single one of the three performances that we're doing at the Macmillan Theater. Some of the other highlights of our ticketed program. The festival this year opens with The Life and Death of Marina Abramovich, directed by Robert Wilson. Music written by Anthony from Anthony and Lee Johnson's and with performances by Marina Abramovich herself as her mother and um, also herself and the great Willem Dafoe playing sort of all the different men in uh, Marina's life. And as music critic like Sasha Freer Jones from The New Yorker said to me after the premiere in Manchester, usually you hope there's one magical moment in a performance that you go and see. But here there was one after the other, after the other, after the other. Um, and here's a little trailer of a film that Jada Cola Grande, Willem Dafoe's wife, made about the process of Wilson's staging of the biography of Marina Abramovich. Uh... 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 Yeah, something like that. Go. I was born just after the war in 46. This was a kind of costume. I always remember it's for me so significant to wear this uniform. It's like a blueprint of that kind of military structure, education, and I really believe that you have to sacrifice everything for the cause. There is a something that is higher and more important than yourself. to know Marina a little bit. I mean, my image of her is she's this very strong woman and aggressive, and she's so fragile. So this little girl, she'll break down and start crying in a moment. And, you know, she's... Uh... This is really the kind of projects I would like to create in the future at Luminato, but unfortunately these really large-scale collaborations take sort of three or four years to develop. But since I was working with Robert Wilson from the inception of this project and Marina's first call, 
with the idea actually for him to direct her biography uh, was to me, I thought this might be a nice bookend to last year's Einstein on the Beach. Um, I will give the pre-performance talks again for, for this um, performance. And since Willem is also very excited to come to Toronto for the four performances at the Bluma Appel Theatre just next door, he has sent us a little video as well. I'm Willem Dafoe, and I'm looking forward to coming to the Luminata Festival with Bob Wilson's Life and Death of Marina Abramovich. It was inspiring for me to collaborate on this piece with two artists that I had admired for years, Bob Wilson and Marina Abramovich. And it's a pleasure to perform, a pleasure to inhabit Bob's landscape, to sing a song Anthony wrote for me, and to shape shift from narrator to the various male figures in Marina's life. See you in Toronto. So if you saw Einstein on the beach last year or did not see it, and regret it, of course, uh, this is really the one performance uh, you should not miss. The Life and Death of Marina Abramovich is supported by Visa Infinite. Marina is sort of a little bit the gravitational center or mother um, of this year's festival. Her immense body of work that has single-handedly raised performance art into the canon of the visual arts radiates into many different aspects of the program. As part of our visual arts program, we are producing the world premiere of the Marina Abramovich Institute prototype. The piece was commissioned and funded by the Metamatic Research Initiative, an Amsterdam-based foundation that gave 10 smaller grants and two major grants, and I mean European major grants. Um, one of them um, was to Marina, to visual artists to create works that resonate with the ideas of the great Swiss artist Jean Tanguely. In the 50s, Tanguely developed the so-called metamatic machines, scrap metal arrangements that include an easel with a piece of paper attached to it. Once powered up, the machine would make an abstract drawing that Tanguely then signed. He posed questions about the nature of the artwork, the relationship of the artist to the work, and questions the cult around the um, artist as the auteur of autonomous pieces of work. But let's hear and see how Marina reinterpreted this relationship through the looking glass of her own work with the easel, paper, pencil, marble, and all other artistic materials become the body of the, of the artist. What is the MAI? MAI is Marina Abramovich Institute, who is going to open next year in Hudson, upstate New York. But in the meantime, we build a prototype a much smaller version of the Institute. This prototype is going to have a premiere during the Luminato Festival and is going to be placed in the park in the center of Toronto. I hope the people from Toronto can enjoy it and I'm very looking for the reaction. I'm also so pleased to be the part of Luminato Festival, who is a very important experimental festival and also internationally recognized. What is really significant with this work is that she basically entrusts the position of the artist in her work, the performer, to the audience. The audience becomes the missing link in completing the work. The experience of a work of art and the creation of it are one and the same. The piece will debut at Luminato before it then travels around the world. It's already um, scheduled to go to Basel, to the Jean Tanguy Museum in the fall. It'll be set up in Trinity Bellwoods, and it's arrangement of seven interlocking pavilions in a circle, and the audience goes through a two-hour experience um, with headsets on that have Marina's voice in three different languages, but since Toronto is such a multicultural city, we've added, um, I think, six others, and we'll have it in Mandarin, Tagalog, Urdu, German, we got German for free, and um, and each pavilion, there is a different exercise or a different performative event that the audience sort of undergoes themselves, which are extracts of Marina's uh, wide career. So she gives, she says, you give me time, I give you experience. You can buy tickets through our website and sign up for a performance slot. The prototype will run each day from noon to 2 a.m. in the morning and on weekends already starting at 8 a.m. The Marina Circle will be closed with a public lecture by her at the Winter Garden on Tuesday, June 18th. She recently um, told me she did a lecture in Oslo 
where they had to change the venue three times as the audience grew to around 4,000. So perhaps we'll end up hosting Marina at the Rogers Center. All the Marina Abramovich activities are made possible by the generous support of our Marina Abramovich circle, Jonas and Linda Prince, the Hal Jackman Foundation, Phil and Ely Taylor, who did not raise her hand um, when Janice asked her who the supporters are that are here, and Invesco. They already fell in love with her, and now everyone here in Toronto is next. Two of our evening illuminations are centered around Marina's work. Evening illuminations are interdisciplinary talks that we are launching this year as part of the literature and ideas program, which take topics from festival shows and projects and invites a diverse group of specialists to delve deeper. The Power of the Mutual Gaze, a conversation with artists, neurologists, filmmakers, as well as quantum leaps of creativity, which looks at the phenomenon of how ideas that change our perception of reality come to life. How does something that did not exist before pop into our consciousness? Both talks I derive from a close examination of Marina's work. Other talks in this series are a discussion titled City as a Stage, between the great sociologist and explorer of public space and modern society, Professor Richard Sennett, Wagner Verdi, a love story with uh, the great Gerard Mortier, Alexander Neef, who used to work for Gerard in, in, in Paris, Rufus Wainwright and others, and a talk with the great choreographer Mark Morris, whose work fuses music and movement in a very profound way, again with Gerard Mortier, who's coming from Madrid, who actually commissioned the piece that we're um, presenting by Mark Moore's L'Allegro um, for the Brussels Opera. The City as Stage Illumination is supported by the British Council Canada and is developed in partnership with City Age. L'Allegro, Il Penseroso ed Il Moderato by Mark Morris with Georg Friedrich Handel's music and Milton's words, performed by the great Toronto Baroque combo Tafel Music, conducted by Jane Glover, will be the major dance piece this, at this year's Luminato Festival at the Sony Center. Let's hear what Mark has to say about bringing this work, maybe his magnum opus, and certainly one of the most gratifying and beautiful dance works for the first time ever to Canada. Hello, this is Mark Morris. I run the Mark Morris Dance Group, and we're happy to be coming to the Luminato Festival again in gorgeous Toronto. It will be my company, the Mark Morris Dance Group, uh, Tafa Musique, the excellent period orchestra, a set of wonderful singers, and the great conductor Jane Glover. We're happy to be coming back. We like it there. We wish we danced in Canada more than we do, but maybe something will happen now. I'm also very much looking forward to the other shows besides my own because the program looks super interesting and good. And uh, we'll see you in Toronto. The pre-performance talks for this performance are going to be held by Michael Crabb. These performances are presented by TELUS. I'm particularly proud about the next project. About a year ago, I saw the work of Ronnie Burkett for the first time, I have to admit, in my life, and was totally blown away by his raunchy mixture of puppet theater, high art camp, personal tragedies, and comedy. My colleague Naomi Campbell gave me his email address, and I wrote to him several times. He didn't answer me a few times asking to meet with him, which finally resulted in me visiting his studio, one of the most beautiful and organized artist spaces I've ever seen in my life. I wish my office would look like that. He told me about a project that he's been hoping to realize for a long time and has been developing for 20 years, the Daisy Theater, a contemporary remake of this underground Czech political puppet cabaret theater during the German occupation of Prague in the 1940s. Somewhere in the middle of our meeting, he asked me shyly, how do I actually pitch a project to Luminato? And I kind of laughed out and I said to him, Ronnie, I'm pitching you to do something at the festival. So here's Ronnie talking about the Daisy Theater, which will be presented every night of the festival at 9.30 p.m. at the Berkeley Street Theater. Hi, I'm Ronnie Burkett. I'm here in my studio in Toronto to tell you about my new project with Luminato 2013, The Daisy Theatre. The Daisy Theatre is a new show every night. I'm making 35 marionettes. I've invited 10 Canadian playwrights to write 10-minute playlets for this company of marionettes. There'll be set musical numbers, variety turns, 
two of those plays every night and lots of me improvising with marionettes. It's going to be provocative, it's going to be slightly offensive, it's going to be tender, sweet, funny, dirty, whatever the day brings. So that's the Daisy Theatre at Luminato 2013. Did you see the books in the background, how they were organized? <laughs> Incredible. Uh, the piece is co-commissioned by UCLA Live in California and Luminato. It is the first commission of my tenure as artistic director in the theater field, and I'm particularly proud that we managed to co-commission it with an institution where Ronnie's work has never been seen before, in a city where his work has never been uh, presented, as it is really important for me that we function as a launch pad and a connector for Canadian as well as international artists. And the fact that this piece is in our program will hopefully make also a lot of our international audiences and members um, um, of our colleagues um, go and check it out and hopefully invite it over. The Daisy Theatre is supported by the McLean Foundation. The Berkeley Street Theatre is becoming somewhat of a late night festival hub, um, sort of the underground alternative to um, David Pico Square. It will also be the artist lounge, the spot where hopefully all the artists from the festival come, will come at the end of the day to hang out and mingle with the lucky few who bought tickets for the Daisy Theatre and a second show that we're presenting at the Berkeley Street Theatre every night of the festival from 11.30 p.m. to 1.30 a.m. The Courtyard Review, hosted by Jason Collette. It takes the idea of Jason Collette's super successful basement reviews, an annual Toronto tradition that started at the Dakota Hotel. For Luminato, Jason will totally refresh this concept daily, drawing most of the talent from the festival's pool of artists and mixing in other local artists. It is a festival almost within the festival. You might have just heard electronic beats of Matmos or the loops of Billy Bezinski coming out of the pit at the Bluma Appel Theatre, but now you see them next to you standing in the audience listening to Vincent Lam read and minutes later on stage performing in the lobby of the Berkeley Street Theatre. With Jason and Ronnie, we're bringing some of the best of Toronto also to our international audience and presenters. This project, though, you're never going to know who's actually going to perform every night, so it's a complete um, surprise. And here's Jason talking a little bit about the Courtyard Review. I'm Jason Collette, host of Luminato's Courtyard Review, a partnering uh, and a celebration of the international talent featured at this year's Luminato, along with the best in musical and literary talent from Toronto's Basement Review series that I've been a part of curating for the last six years. The review is essentially a variety show, half literary, half music, but all rock and roll. It's a cool cross-pollination between the disciplines sharing the stage as well as some spontaneous collaborations. The Courtyard Review is the late night after party element of the festival. Uh, it'll be happening every night of the run and it's going to be kind of like a wedding reception party, if you will. we got a bar, funny stories are going to be told, poetry will be read, songs will be sung, and then everybody's favorite part, young and old alike, the wedding band. Um, good times and dancing are mandatory. But this element of the night will showcase one of the most exciting artistic goings on in Toronto of late. We have a burgeoning cover band scene here selling out sizable venues around town. And it's a scene that's begun making the cover band into a higher art form. So 10 nights of fun at the Berkeley Street Theater, the Courtyard Review. Thank you. You can see he's a very existential artist, and he's been thinking a lot about the lighting for this uh, video. Um, the Courtyard Reviews um, at Luminato is presented by Mill Street Brewery with support from Redken. About 10 months ago, I drove down to Mass Mocha in North Adams, Massachusetts, to see the O Canada exhibition, a survey of contemporary Canadian art curated by Denise Marconish. It's probably the biggest uh, uh, survey of contemporary Canadian art in a decade. Um, she and I met and I proposed to her that we should do a project together that draws from her experience and research and incorporates the parameters of a festival that is so different from a museum. No walls, short time, hopefully Big Bang. She told me that almost all the artists came to the opening at Mass Mocha and many did not know each other or had not seen each other for a long time. It was like a class reunion without a class. In a normal group show, <clears throat> You bring the work of artists together in a space and create a dialogue and tension. So we said, what if we brought these artists actually together in a space before a work is conceived 
<coughs> and locked them in until they agreed on one collective idea. So this is what we did. Uh, they're still locked in somewhere. No, actually not. Um, uh, and Stockpile is what came out. Um, we selected nine artists from all across Canada with diverse practices, and they did actually come up with one idea already. Stockpile is a gigantic version of an arcade claw machine, those machines that you put a loony in and then you direct a claw in a, in a position and from which it goes sort of down into a pile of cheap treasures and hopefully brings it out for you, or maybe not, as in most cases. In Stockpile, the claw is actually going to be one of the nine artists who's manipulated by the audience into position. And the artists want your stuff. So the objects are donated, the objects in, the, uh, in Stockpile are donated by fellow Torontonians, objects that no longer have value for the owner, but may be considered priceless by someone else. We actually have certain limits though on what we accept, nothing that needs water, um, no babies, no living um, animals or anything like that. Um, various drop-off locations and times are listed in our brochure that I think is still not here and, um, and on our webpage. Here are the artists and Denise talking themselves about Stockpile a little bit. This video was actually shot during the last of the three intense sessions before the artists finally sort of revealed their idea to us. And it talks a lot about the collaborative process and the typical Canadian politeness. We, we pretty much proved the cliche that Canadians are very polite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and I was, yeah. Pretty much. That was one of the things I thought in the last workshop yeah. too. Well, I was saying to somebody like uh, earlier today that I, you know, we came up with this idea, so I knew we could do it, but I never thought it would go this smoothly. Like that you would. But I said to you, I did like, say to you, I think at one point, oh, don't worry, they're, yeah. <laughs> they're Canadians. <laughs> they're Canadian. But like <laughs> that nice you. To each other. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. But that you've sort of come to ideas is mm. like that. It's only taken us these sort of three sessions, which has been a lot of work and a lot mm. of work that you've all taken home with you. But that we've come so far to having ideas and having ideas that everybody's really excited about and I think that that does have to do with some of that like cliched Canadian politeness is that you hear everybody out mm -hmm. and that you all came to this and sort of understood the collaborative process. I realize like you said uh, ca Canadian are very respectful each other and uh, and I think I just thinking wow I will learn so much and, uh, and I, I will say thank you for every of you because uh, I learned so much of things. And what is, was the most beautiful thing is how much idea we had. It's like yes. non-stop. <laughs> wow, it was, <laughs> it, it was fantastic. <clears throat> that, is, that is true. They actually had a lot of ideas and they also had a lot of bad ideas. Um, the artists are Dean Baldwin from Toronto, Brendan Fernandez, Kenyan born of Indian descent, lives and works in Toronto and New York, Diane Landry, who you just saw from Quebec City, Divya Mera from Winnipeg, Luanne Martineau from British Columbia, Graham Patterson, born in Saskatoon, who lives in New Brunswick now, Ed Peen, Taiwanese Canadian living in Toronto, and I think Ed is here also, Charles Stankiewicz, born in the Yukon, and Mitchell Weber, born in Calgary, living in Halifax. The project is going to um, happen at Brookfield Place. It's going to be open um, for, for almost the entire opening hours and everyone can play for not one loony but two loonies. Um, the project is presented by TD Bank Group with support from La Fondation Emmanuel Gattuso. I'm particularly excited about all the projects we've developed together with Jessica Dargo Kaplan, our wonderful Director of Education and Community Outreach. We've stopped thinking of hers as a separate department and made it really part of the core program, bringing the participants, both grown-ups and children, directly into the festival. What is important to me is that anything we do in this direction starts with a strong artistic idea, like every other aspect of the festival. Our food program at the distillery district on the opening weekend is turning on its generational head. It will essentially be run by children from various school programs around town. About 25 Toronto chefs are going to work with these children, and they've already started, and teach them about food, teach them how to cook, and their life. And 
it's actually going to be the children that are going to cook at the food stations. Together with Darren O'Donnell and his wonderful team from Mammalian Diving Reflex, we've devised this program that will include a challenge for the best food station. Some of the children that have been apprenticed with the chefs will serve as so-called hawkers, roaming around the distillery district trying to persu persuade you to buy the food from their chef and eat it at the kids' table, a large dining area that is completely hosted and run by the kids. In a food lab challenge, four times over the weekends, the chefs have to prepare meals with food items selected by the kids, and then will be judged by them for who um, prepared the most successful meal. The price for each meal remains the same at, at um, $5, although we encourage people to give a little bit more so we can actually continue our work with the children. My dream is to bring the kids to homes for the elderly where they could apply the skills that they've learned before and prepare meals for them in the month after the festival. We've changed the name of the program slightly from Thousand Tastes of Toronto to Future Tastes of Toronto at the kids' table. It is, it is still an event for the entire family that celebrates the vibrancy of Toronto food scene as seen through younger eyes. Our food program this year again is presented by the President's Choice. The student workshops are also supported by the Ontario Arts Council. Since January, David Leventhal, Leslie Garrison and Uta Takamura from the Mark Morris Dance Group and Mark Morris's groundbreaking Dance for PD and PD stands for Parkinson's disease program, have worked with youth from Nelson Mandela Public School and Winchester Junior Public School and members of Toronto's Dancing with Parkinson's, founded by Sarah Robichaud, on dances and movement sections based on Mark Morris's L'Allegro. The L'Allegro Movement Project will be about 40 minutes of da dance material presented at the Adder Slate Hall at Daniel Spectrum, free to the public, on Wednesday, June 19th. All the music will be performed live by Tafel Music under the baton of Jane Glover with soprano Shannon Mercer and baritone Douglas Williams. I'm especially grateful to Jean Lamont and Trisha Baldwin of Tafel Music and the, um, and the conductor and the soloists for making this happen and actually donating their services um, for this project. It was really important for me that we give these new performers the same conditions at, as the Mark Morris Dance Group on the Sony stage. The project, as well as the appearance of the Mark Morris Dance Group, is presented by TELUS, with additional support from Mohammed Al Zaybak, who also did not raise his hand, a wonderful uh, founding luminary of Toronto and a wonderful patron of, of the festival. Uh, the third project of the outreach program is called School Days, you all remember. It is a collaboration with the Toronto-based music label Arts and Crafts, which is celebrating its 10th anniversary, so our um, older brother. Some of the artists are working with students from the Regent Park Music School, teaching them their repertoire, and then um, will be performing with these students as their backup band. We're doing two shows, one in the community itself, again at the Ada Slate Hall on Friday the 21st at 8 p.m. And I insisted also that we do this show on the main stage at the Festival Hub, um, which finally everyone agreed to, on Saturday the 22nd at 3 p.m. I wanted the students really to have the experience of performing sort of in a large rock festival kind of um, crowd to hopefully a large crowd. This project is presented by Scotiabank through their Bright Future program and supported by Slate Music, who's been instrumental in helping emerging Canadian music talent find their voice. And since we're sort of back at the hub, I did not mention all the activities that we're doing with the TSO this year. Um, after the grand success of last year's outdoor concert that closed the festival and the TSO late night, we decided we would again take the orchestra outside and again also go late into the night with them. But since meeting with Loey Follett, who's also here, and the incredible team of the Toronto Symphony Orchestra are probably the most fun-filled meetings I have, I wanted more. I know that a cousin of Peter Ungin is from the original Monty Python's Flying Circus, but the TSO team in itself is a true comedy show. Um, so the CBC, if you want to have a sort of, what are these called, real reality shows, um, the TSO is really the place to go. But it's a productive one. Uh, the TSO Late Night is on June 15th with a double bill by piano star Yu Jia Wang. The Free Luminato Outdoor Concert with the TSO this year falls on Friday, the 21st at 8 p.m. and is surrounded around the birthdays of three great composers. Wagner, who we already mentioned, Giuseppe Verdi, also both are 200, and Mary Schaefer. 
We can't count on Richard or Giuseppe to be there, but certainly Murray will be, who is celebrating his 80th birthday this year. And the Mendelssohn Choir is going to augment the orchestra on some of the beautiful excerpts from Verdi and Wagner operas. And now, my secret pet project, our third collaboration with the TSO and the Toronto Symphony Youth Orchestra. Toronto's first ever music mob on Saturday, June 22nd at 2 p.m. But here's Peter um, talking about his new favorite orchestra first. Okay, I'm here to talk to you about a completely new idea, something that's going to happen on June 22nd at 1.30 p.m. in David Pico Square. It's called the Music Mob, and it's a new initiative. We're very excited to join with Luminato on this project, and we're inviting the City of Toronto to come and perform with members of the TSO. So whether you've been playing for years, uh, or you're completely new to an instrument, or perhaps you just want to participate on a kazoo, or you just want to sing along, or you just love music, it doesn't matter. We want you to turn up. The two pieces that we're going to play are the Ride of the Valkyries from um, uh, Wagner and the Triumphal March from Aida. And it might actually become really the largest orchestra ever to perform in Toronto, at least that's our ambition. But we need the help of anyone who's ever picked up an instrument, as Peter said, no matter what it is. We've pre prepared nine instructional videos for instruments and voice that you can watch online on our webpage, featuring members of the Toronto Symphony Youth Orchestra and the Mendelssohn Choir. You can download also the, the, the instrumental parts from our webpage. They're already there and ready to be retrieved. So you can read the music and see and hear how it is supposed to be performed. Just match your instrument with the right tutorial and start rehearsing. Then bring the music, your instrument, and your heart and play on David Pico Square. We've simplified the parts actually a little bit so that everyone can participate. And if your instrument of choice does not fit into a classical orchestra, no problem. Bring along your saxophone, your bagpipe, Janice actually is a um, supreme bagpipe player, and she has already signed up. Um, the ukulele, banjo, the recorder, euphonium, or guitar, any instrument actually the, that you like. And if your instrument of choice isn't, including among our, isn't included among our instructional videos, there's an email address, and someone friendly and funny from the festival or the TSO, funnier from the TSO maybe, um, will help you get it out sorted. The Music Mob is also presented by Scotiabank. This year, much of our magic program centers around music. Music is invisible to our ears, just as magic is. In collaboration with David Ben and Magicana, and generously supported by the Slate family, we've put together three fantastic programs that David should tell you about himself. Um, he's in the audience, but he will actually disappear now from the audience and magically appear on the screen. My name is David Ben, and I am the artistic director of Magicana. This year, Illuminato has invited us to, well, cross over. That is, to explore different disciplines and how they relate to magic. So with that in mind, we've invited three maestros of magic. The first, from Granada, is a show entitled Concerto for Piano and Pasteboards, performed by the Spanish magician Miguel Puga and the pianist Pat Sabather. Then bracketing the festival, that is in the closing weekend, we've invited a Venezuelan performer by the name of Rafael Benatar. Now Rafael happens to be a virtuoso player of the lute and the classical guitar, but he's also a fabulous magician. And he's gonna perform a 90 minute show exploring the relationship between his three instruments in a show we've entitled Compositions. And then the third performer, the one who will be performing midweek, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, two shows a night, is Steve Cohen. Now Steve is the resident performer at the Waldorf Astoria in New York, and he rarely performs outside the confines of that exclusive audience. But we have him here for three days, six shows, performing magic, and on a very intimate basis. So, we'd love to see you at Luminato, and we suggest you reserve your tickets before they disappear. It seems that Ronnie and um, 
uh, David sort of talk a lot about organizing their libraries. During lunch hour every weekday at the Luminato Lounge at the Hub, you can hear artists from the festival talk with each other and with local artists and thinkers. And this year, you can actually really have your lunch here as each day there will be different trucks from the Ontario Food Truck Association, Food Truck Eats, who are partnering exclusively with us for that week to bring lunch and ideas straight to your mouth and hearts and stay right through the entire night to serve our entire program and audience. A bold new literary experience this year is a literary picnic held at Trinity Bellwoods Park near the Marina Abramovich Institute prototype on Saturday the 22nd from noon to 4 p.m. We've decided to change the literary program this year a little bit and get the authors out of the dark um, salon, closer to the audience, into the open air, and actually start conversations about beginnings. How do you start writing? How do you start a story? How do we begin at all? Curated by the wonderful Michael Redhill and Josh Nelman, about 60 authors will read on three stages in a marathon sort of rock festival setting throughout the afternoon. In our special backstage area, the audience has the chance to sign up uh, for one-on-one -on -one sessions with such authors as Don Gilmore, Vincent Lamb, Miranda Hill, and Camilla Gibb, joining them on picnic blankets for direct exchanges about their work. A third circle around the three stages will provide opportunities to buy picnic food if you did not bring it, buy the author's books and get them autographed, and also bring the book you've read too many times or got several times from your great aunt and exchange them for other books uh, from other fellow Torontonians. We wanted to find a new way to interact with literature and writers and could not think of anything more fun than a whole afternoon in the park. I hope the community will agree. Partners for this event include the Toronto Public Library, whose bookmobile will be on site, Type Bookstore, First Aid, and CBC's Canada Rights Program. And there's a lot more of the literary and ideas program that you will find in the brochure and on our webpage. Following the idea of presenting literature in a new way, we decided this year to print our own festival newspaper and gave it the title Light News and the byline, a performance in print. Light news is what we imagine the perfect art section to be. It only covers us. Um, just kidding, but it's actually true. Um, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, it will come out every day in a limited edition, distributed at all major festival venues, and will contain an array of content called from the artists from the festival and contributors from around Toronto. The newspaper will feature daily reviews of festival program by accomplished writers and children a blind date section, which is actually an interview via, via text messages by two artists uh, from the festival who only have their cell phone, their, each other's cell phone numbers, but not their actual names, a daily rumor that the audience can vote on whether it's real or not, and when tickets to shows, a Proustian questionnaire where we give the answers and the artist has to come up with the question. The paper will have an independent curatorial voice, and if a reviewer did not like a show, that's what we're going to print. It is not so much a newspaper about the program, but it really is part of the program. The paper will also be designed by a Pentagram and distributed by a volunteer force of newsboys and girls and through our special Kia vehicle. We are in bed with the New York Times this year. Times Talks has been a huge success in New York, but has to date only been presented outside Manhattan in Spain and the Sundance Festival. Now it is traveling north to become Times Talks Luminato. On opening weekend, we feature four conversations between leading New York Times journalists and artists of the festival, such as Robert Wilson, Willem Dafoe, the architects Charles Renfro and Liz Diller, Adam Agoyan, and performers uh, from the Joni Mitchell tribute. Um, all the events will be live streamed on the Times and our websites and will spread the glory um, of Toronto and this festival throughout the world. We kicked off this partnership uh, with a Times Talks in New York last month with Marina Brownovich that was sold out um, almost instantly and when I checked the next day already had 6,000 people who viewed it online. And yes, we haven't forgotten about what a lot of people care about either and it's sort of the anti-striptease, it's fashion. In a North American premiere, we're presenting dolls by Victor and Rolf with the Royal Ontario Museum at the William Thorsell Spirit House. Um, I don't know if William, actually, you know that we're going to take over your spirit house, so pack your bags. Um, access is free to the public. For a career retrospective at the Barbican Museum in London, Victor and Rolf have taken over 
have taken a totally new approach to presenting an overview of their 20-year uh, career that has placed them among the most important innovators and creators of conceptual and glamorous fashion. They crafted an army of Chinese porcelain dolls, about 48 centimeters high, with precise miniature versions of their creations from their fashion shows. You actually can see one of them up there. Um, even the fabrics were produced in a to-scale downsized version. Here's a short video of Victor Horsting and Rolf Snurren talking about the exhibit. They're actually coming to Toronto today. They're on a plane right now for an appearance at the Bay, and we try to rearrange the schedule to be here in time for the press conference, but unfortunately there was no flight that um, could have got them um, here in time. Hello, Toronto. We are very excited that Luminato is bringing the dolls to the Royal Ontario Art Museum. This will only be the third time that they will be on view, and the very first time that they can be seen outside of Europe. We have been working on our dolls for years, and they are really special to us. Each and every collection we created is represented by one or more dolls. All together, they give a good overview of our work. They are like little icons. Especially for Illuminato, we created an installation with Studio Job to showcase a selection of dolls. The exhibition is a made-to-measure environment created specifically for the ROM. It is our pleasure to be a part of Luminato and we hope you will enjoy our dolls. The show will actually run at the ROM until June 30th. And I left one of my personal highlights for last. Joni, a portrait and song, a birthday um, happening live at Massey Hall. After the incredible celebration of Kate McGarrigal's music at last year's Luminato Festival, everyone said, how can this become as good next year as this year? Anne McKagan um, from the CBC um, actually asked me whether I would consider paying homage to Joni Mitchell's music at this year's festival, especially since 2013 marks her 70th birthday. I said, that sounds like an interesting idea, but I said only if she is really involved and somehow also endorses the idea. I asked her whether she had any contacts to her or whether the CBC had any contacts to her, and she said that Joni is completely retired and it's almost impossible to get in touch with. I thought, wow, now it gets sort of interesting. So um, it took me about three months and speaking to a lot of people, a lot, um, who've ever worked with her or had other dealings with her, and nobody could really help until I finally hit on someone who's worked with her, um, who's said, I'm talking to her almost every week, I love this idea, I'm going to tell her about this, and set up a conference call, which happened about a month later um, between 10.30 p.m. and 12 um, p.m., oh no, 12 a.m., um, and that call will definitely be part of my to be uh, published uh, autobiography um, when I'm um, 85 years old. Um, over the past few months, I had many phone calls and personal encounters with Joni. And apart from the fact that she is one of the greatest um, two or three, and I mean really two or three, or in some people's uh, thoughts, also really the greatest songwriters in the world, in the world, she's an absolutely fascinating and warm human being who's incredibly touched that anyone is still interested in her music. She really said that to me. And was thrilled that we would connect this to her 70th birthday, as she never thought she would make it this far. She's been a close advisor on all the musical talent that we're bringing together on stage, starting with the band under the musical directorship of Brian Blade, who she calls the greatest jazz drummer alive, and John Coward. Performers include Chaka Khan, who Joni says can actually sing any of her songs and screw, screw up as much as she wants, Oscar-winning um, artist Glenn Hansard, uh, Rufus Wainwright, and actually not at the request, not by marital contract, but at the request of our producer, Danny Kapelian, who's here. And um, he just told me before uh, the press conference, he just got off the phone with uh, Liz Wright's people, and she has confirmed um, her participation as well. Here's what Brian has to say about celebrating Joni and her singular oeuvre. Hello, my name is Brian Blade and I'm thankful to be making this little film about uh, an upcoming tribute concert uh, celebrating Joni Mitchell, uh, the Luminato Festival uh, in Toronto, Canada. Uh, on June 18th and 19th, uh, 
we'll celebrate Joni, uh, a portrait and song, um, music spanning uh, her entire career, uh, beginning with Song to a Seagull in 1968 to Taming the Tiger in 1998. Um, she's been uh, an inspiration, uh, pioneer, and has touched so many people um, in that time and, and as she still is and we're thankful to uh, tip a hat to her as many times as we're able to and uh, we hope that you can join us uh, at Massey Hall uh, to celebrate Joni uh, this June 18th and 19th. Thank you so much and uh, here's to you. And actually, in my last lunch that I had with her in LA, she said that she wants to come. She also sings regularly some new melodies that she's working um, um, over the phone or in person. And I asked her if uh, we could maybe premiere one of her songs. And she said, sure, why not, if I finish it in time. Um, Joni, a portrait and song is presented by Sun Life Financial and supported by, the Slate, um, by Slate Music. This is 2013, although I'm sure I've forgotten a lot, but once you leave, hopefully our brochures will have arrived. Have they arrived? Yeah. They have? Oh, wow. OK, great. Uh, yay! So I guess we'll have them ready for you at the, um, at the entrance or exit, um, however you see it. And uh, please do take one home and, and, and look through them. I think they're really quite uh, beautiful. What is really important for me is to create dialogues among the different aspects of the programming. Not one artist is don't only doing one thing in the festival, but appears in multiple ways. So the audience can see different facets of their work. A festival is not a maze with only one way to enter and exit. To me, it is more like a playground. We offer the tools, but for you to combine them and play with them to your liking. There's not one way to experience, but only your way. There are a myriad of themes and connecting points between the individual projects. The idea of the Gesamtkunstwerk, a total work of art, was one of the guiding principles, but to me it is really more of a metaphor of the festival as a whole. The sound produced when myriads of voices are carefully woven together, empowering the audience to become a participant in the work, thinking about new formats to present traditional content, paving a new way to experience art, a festival within the festival, the city as a stage, the mutual gaze, the power of seduction, the next generation are other threads that weave through the festival. It is like a brain. Everything is connected and thoughts and emotions are results of a complex network of firing neurons. To experience Luminato, you have to let yourself go and succumb to the path of seduction that I hope we've laid out. By connecting and bundling different projects and program conceptually, logistically, we're trying to make it easy for you to experience different things that you would not normally go to. I know that falling in love is the most difficult thing to achieve, and sometimes one is actually amazed at what one falls in love with or who one falls in love with, but I think we have everything one needs to make it happen. Good stuff to see, to hear, to taste, to smell, and to feel. I really want to thank everyone at Luminato who's worked tirelessly to put this program together from marketing to sponsorship, finance, ticketing, programming of course, and production. All the many interns, seasonal workers, staff that grows to almost 100 by the time the festival starts to blossom, and our hundreds of volunteers. These are really the ones that make it all happen while I get to enjoy most of it, or let's say 10 minutes of everything. Our incredible volunteer program is supported by Manulife Financial. Tickets go on sale on April 16th, today, um, uh, until the 19th for Visa Infinite card holders, and then the general um, sale starts on April 20th. And please check out luminatofestival.com, our new URL, for our new look, more program and more details, and your instrumental parts to participate in the music mob. I would like to thank everyone, um, our corporate marketing, government, and foundation partners, as well as our founding luminaries, patrons, and donors who help to bring the festival experience to audiences every year. And I finally want to thank you for listening to me for such a long time. I feel like I've completed my striptease for today. And um, right after this, um, Sao will be uh, performing um, one song. So, and stay, please, for some more drinks. 
and conversation. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jorn. It is very hard to fit 10 days of creativity into this one event. Um, I'd like to tell you that that's why he spoke so quickly, but he talks like that all the time around the office. No, it's great. A lot of energy. Um, so yes, the brochures are here. Um, Sao is going to join us um, for a very short musical performance. It wouldn't be a Luminato press conference without uh, that. Um, they are sometimes referred to as the Jackson Five of Chad. They are performing at the Festival Hub on June 20th. They're joining us today from Montreal. So please come to the stage, Sal. Thank you all again for coming. How are you guys doing? Great. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for having us here today. We're going to be really short. This coming song is on our last album. It's called Fatimata. Smile again. Oh, I just must say I don't know. Release my pens away, make me leave again. Oh, I just must say I don't know. I've been hiding for so, so long. long. Is there any way to, to get out? Fatima Taye. Hey. I'm saying I don't know. Oh, you must say I'm old. Give me nango, I say, Kangana. Fatima Tae. Mmm. Mmm. Comment vais-je gérer cette condition de l'âme Et de ma Comment ferais-je pour me reprendre en main Et de ma Je me suis trop habitué à ton visage Plonger un petit peu trop loin dans ton regard un coin de rue, un bar, tout me ramène à toi. Fatimatae, oui yo. Un sourire, un parfum, tout me rappelle toi. Fatimatae, oh. Un coin de rue, un bar, tout me ramène à toi. Mm -hmm. Breathing to me, make me laugh again. Mm -hmm. I'm saying I don't move. Ah, Daddy, mm -hmm. my pants away, make me feel alive again. Daddy, mm -hmm. I'm out of move. I've been hiding for so long. Is there any way, way to get out? Did my time? Thank you.